Rabbi Ed Feinstein said at a recent USCJ programming that the great Jewish sport is worrying. When I boarded a plane on the evening of December 22nd, I have to admit, I was a prime competitor. As seasoned mission leader extraordinaire Wayne Goldstein and I gathered with our group of 60 Temple Emmanuel members in Israel for our Temple Emmanuel family trip, I wondered, could we connect in the same way in the current climate that previous treks had enabled during different times? Again and again, I was surprised to find that the Israel that we encountered was every bit as meaningful for us as American Jews today as it had ever been, perhaps even more so. Why? Because what we encountered again and again was not politics, but people like you and me striving to honestly and openly reconcile competing and conflicting visions. Israelis whose history is long enough to know that just when it feels the darkest, miracles can and often do happen. We arrived in Israel on Hanukkah. And immediately upon arrival, we received a dreidel that differs from the one that we use here in America. In America, or anywhere else in the diaspora, as many of you know, our dreidels read, Nun Gimel He Shim, Nes Gadol Haya Sham. A great miracle happened there. There's a distance. It's a story that happened long ago to someone else over there. It's easy to disconnect. But in Israel, the shin is replaced by a pay. Nes gadol haya po. A great miracle happened here. And throughout our journey together, we saw that those words not only apply to our past, but to our present. That Israel is a place where the capacity for miracles occurring now is ever present. Some we saw in ways that were intimate and personal, just like the member of our group who, gazing at the ancient city of Jaffa, threw down the coastline to the bustling modern city of Tel Aviv, reflected on how he felt his parents' presence there. They had always wanted to make it to Israel, but never had. And now he was the first one in thousands of years in his family lineage to set foot upon those shores. Wow. Other moments of miracle were shared by all. For example, the kindness of our restaurant hosts when we arrived drenched, dazed, and deluged from running lost on the slippery streets of Tel Aviv in a rainstorm of, I kid you not, biblical proportions. <laughs> a teenager among us slipped just moments before the power box nearby was struck by lightning. Had he not slipped, he would have been in its path. Nes Gadol Haya. Po. Rabbi Ed Feinstein, in speaking about the American Jewish landscape, called out our proclivity for worry and affirmed that, yes, there are reasons to worry, but then he encouraged us to abandon that narrative, to find, as he said, some hope in the creative process of Jewish resilience. 
He concluded his counsel instead of saying, oi, va voi, it's the end of everything. Look at what's happening. Let's talk about what we can do with what is happening. Those words echoed with me throughout our travels in Israel. All around, wherever we went, we encountered Israelis who were talking about and acting upon the question of what can we do with what is happening. Much as we Americans are no less invested in our aspirations for our nation, when one party or another, even one with whom we may vehemently disagree, is ascendant, so too, in our travels, we repeatedly saw Israelis rolling up their sleeves to double down at the community level on building the Israel that they want to see. Nes gadol haya po. At our sister school in Haifa, Zichron Yosef, where our beloved master religious school teacher, Yona Rosenman, of blessed, blessed memory, created an indelible bond, our kids met their fifth grade pen pals. It was magical. One teen came back to the school, especially to meet one of our high schoolers, because they had maintained their correspondence since their elementary school years. As we were welcomed with open arms, joyous music, and deep enthusiasm by the staff and kids at the school, they shared with us their curriculum of educating for democracy that would put any of our local schools to shame. Three young girls took us on a tour around their school into their school bomb shelter where they had actually taken this place and turned it into the most magnificent dance studio. What do you do when there are sirens and you have to take shelter here, we asked. The fifth grader leading us responded, we come here, we wait, we dance. At the top of Masada, our group gathered for spirited prayers in the ancient synagogue, only to find ourselves joined by a group of secular Israeli tourists, some of whom were seeming like they were trying to remember the words. And they were joined by some French and Russian travelers and a Temple Emmanuel family who had been traveling on their own in Israel who we just happened to run into in that spot. And then there were some young men with black kipot and tzitzit hanging who couldn't help but poke their heads in and sing along, smiling at this Am Yisrael Chai moment in a time of increasing distance between denominations of Jews, that is truly nes gadol haya po. At the Syrian border, while we were jeeping, a battalion of soldiers and a tank practiced scaling the hill in battle conditions. And we saw the reality of an Israel that occupies a tough neighborhood whose 18-year-olds are not planning for college, but for which military post they will serve. An Israel that no matter how much it wants peace must also prepare daily for war. And in that moment, right there, our bus driver, who was this gracious and lovely man, shared with me, surprising me, that he had voted for the current government's more radical elements. Why, I asked him. And he said, because after a generation of borrowing sugar from his Arab neighbors, when the riots broke out last year, they were the first to attack his home. While on Shabbat, at a beautiful Masorti congregation in the city, members there shared with us that because of those same riots, 
and the distance between the communities that had formed, they are passionately continuing one-to-one -one coexistence efforts, continuing to use their building as a gathering space for Jews and Arabs to try to build a grassroots road towards peace. And then we went to a place called Na Laga'at. Na Laga'at is known in English as Dialogue in the Dark. And a group of us were guided through the pitch black. And when I say pitch black, I really mean it. I have never experienced darkness like this before. And we were guided there by those who were blind from birth. We learned from a Bedouin young man, Osama, who shared with us that when he's not guided, sighted people through this immersive experience, he works in Israeli medical research and innovation. I wish that I could transport every one of us today to that place so that you could experience what we experienced because the center is made up of several rooms, one simulating an outdoor park, one a living room and a kitchen with all of its intendant tripping hazards, one a seashore, one a market, and one a busy and frankly terrifying road. As we traveled through each completely dark space, we could see nothing, navigating using hearing, touch, and smell alone. I have to admit, I was shaken by the way my senses failed me. In one room, lost and fumbling, Osama grabbed my hand and quickly and calmly led me to the next step as I realized viscerally what that space had been set up to teach. Here, he was the expert. He instructed me that I should listen for the change in sound as I approached the wall. And I tried, but I can't say that I fully understood exactly what he meant, because he had an experience that I did not have. While I never did in that short time get the hang of listening for the wall, I did experience the profound gift of kindness in Osama's steady hand, saying, no worries, reaching out and helping to lead me. I did get a sense of great generosity of the group who called out to me, come, we'll make it this way together. On its own merits, Nalaga'at was radically transformational a new window in what it takes to navigate our world as a blind or differently abled person. Even more so for me as I reflected back, it was a primer in humility. Sometimes we have to lead boldly in one direction, but other times we are best served to listen, learn, and reach out to others who may have a more intuitive sense of the terrain. After all, we were all grappling our way forward, some with one idea of how to get there, some with others, and some paths were more dangerous than we might have wanted to go. And some of us might have wanted to go a different way, but if we didn't give up when we got to a scary spot, there were adjustments that we could make along the way. That is true of Nalagat, and it feels in a very deep sense to be true of Israel today, too. And so we wound up emerging from the dark at the Jerusalem Craft Family Stadium Complex as our families tossed footballs around and ran joyful drills with Israel's leading flag football professionals, both men's and women's teams, and we had a blast. And then we lost a ball towards a part of the field where some local kids were playing. We asked for them to throw it back in Hebrew, and they stared at us with blank faces. We tried English, no luck. 
Then one of our hosts tried Arabic. And the boys laughed and smiled and threw back our balls, happily returning to their game. While the news may bring ample cause for worry, I couldn't help but feel in that moment that as long as there are fields to play on together, there is hope that we will continue into a future where we all can say, Nes Gadol Haya. You know, there are valid reasons for concern, for connection of the next generation to Israel these days. There is too much sham and not enough po. But in Israel, our families came together and we saw a community of communities where continuity, belonging reaches back generations upon generations. And just as Jacob blesses his grandchild children in this week's Parsha Hamalach HaGoel Oti, may the angel who protected me be with you, our Temple Emmanuel grandparents, children and grandchildren experience the ineffable blessing of walking the land together, generation to generation. Wes reminded me this week of a question once asked by Rabbi Gershon Siegel. The angel who blessed me, what kind of a blessing is that? As angels go, Jacob's angel is not a great one. Jacob suffered. He struggles. He had a life marked with pain and trial. What's the answer? Jacob's angel is the one who, when things seemed at their worst, gave Jacob the resilience to press on. That is our resilience. And that is the resilience that we saw and experienced in Israel this past week. Parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren, generation to generation, who together in Israel found home. And what's more, last night, not even a week after touching back down in the States, a group of our kids gathered here for Shabbat dinner, and another group of our teens had a Shabbat sleepover together, bringing the miracle back here to Temple Emmanuel. So, if there is one thing that you do this year. Give yourself and your family the gift of going to Israel so that you too can say, Nes Gadol Haya Po. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>